okay so returning to the case returning to the questions in the case we have already covered these one two three the entire decision problems let me just go back to your page i have just done some reformatting this is too much right so if we go back to the top and we look at decision problems okay so this is the original set of decision problems from the investment fund managing the investment fund maybe i should put even this into but anyway this we are not so concerned with at this point what we are take, doing is taking those same decision problems i just reduced the font size to make everything fit on one page so that it's easier to understand okay let's move this a little bit out so we were looking at whether or not uh, something is actively so same these decision problems which are actively solved which are automatically solved so it's a little easier to understand like this i had to reduce the font size to put everything on one page all right so all this stuff we have done i have also entered the discussions we've already finished the discussion i'm just showing you how i've marked it okay so entry price is active you understand that because the hedging team has the decision has the choice of um, uh, you know they they are able to decide when they want to um, uh, when they want to hedge so the hedging team this uh, they can decide by looking at a chart So they can look at a chart and decide uh, how they want, uh, what time they want to hedge. They know that they are already always going to be on one side. That is, the buy sell decision is automatically decided. But uh, the timing of the entry is uh, is up to the discretion of the hedging team. So therefore, this is. Uh, Okay, so the entry price is active. Okay, that's why. Now exit price, I've not written anything against the exit price per se, because the exit price decision is split into two, exit with loss, exit with profit. So here, and now what I've done here is if you see that at the top of this module, I've written that because to, to make our, uh, you know, to, to give you the essence of the idea, but without making it too complicated. So we have assumed that this entire discussion about how the decision problems, which uh, we faced while managing an investment fund, how the solutions to those decision problems are altered when you're managing a hedge book, okay, to uh, control the risks on a passive risk book, when you're managing a hedge portfolio, how the decision problem solutions are slightly altered where some of the decisions are automatically solved. So when we are discussing that type of, uh, you know, uh, material, we have assumed that this is going to be managed using a static hedging program to make it simpler, okay, to understand the decision, uh, the alterations uh, a little more, because when you start looking at dynamic hedging programs, it's a little more complicated, but the basic logic will remain the same. So the entire discussion here, so whatever I'm writing here is automatic, not applicable. That will become active in the case of a, say for instance, when you look at exit price. Okay, the exit price is automatic because in a static hedging program, once you enter the hedge, you can't exit the hedge. Okay, you only exit the hedge when the position rolls off. When your underlying exposure, the, the underlying material that your uh, inventory that you're hedging, the inventory is sold by the selling team. So the exposure no longer exists and then you close out your hedge. Okay, so that you exit. So therefore, again, it's not your decision. It depends on circumstances. So it's ordered to be written as automatic. So everything becomes automatic with the towards the end on the static hedging programs. But understand that if you're managing a dynamic hedging program, these will become active. Because in a dynamic hedging program, you're actively trying to in and uh, to come in and out of the hedge, like you would buy here. If you're if you are uh, long crude oil on the underlying position, maybe you'll sell here because you feel that it's going to come back down again. 
okay like this one when this oil strike hit the saudi oil complex this price went up but then fell maybe you feel that the same thing is going to happen here it's going to come down so you would hedge your oil position here but then when it comes down to 56 if you feel it's going to turn around again then you would buy it back so if you're managing a dynamic hedging program then the same decision about uh, exit price with loss exit price with profit all these will become active but for our purposes we are discussing it to simplify the scenarios we're discussing it as a static hedging program so therefore the decision making is automatic because once you enter you can't unhedge once you hedge you can't unhedge anymore right this is clear everyone okay so uh, number of units of position size this will also become this is automatic in all cases right so exit price is also automatic for the same reason uh, exit price with profit is also automatic basically you don't get to exit uh, whether you have based on whether you have profit or loss you exit in a static hedging program you exit only when the underlying exposure rolls off okay and the last one is the unit position size number of units or position size the last decision problem on which we spend a lot of time in the in the investment fund case where we try to figure out what is the right position size okay related to the maximum risk per trade all those calculations which we did right so here the situation is much simpler again this uh, so actually I, I should not have written the answer I should have asked you but uh, in my hurry to uh, cover some material I've written the answer so number of units and positions size you realize is automatic okay in the case of a static okay you can say here in the sense that there, there is a you know here we can put in a little um, uh, we can put in a little um, entry price this one should not have the star yeah. we can put in a little double star here okay and So I'm putting a double star here. Why? Because we are discussing the question of the position size. Okay. And I said that it is actually automatic. Okay. But what we have to look at is we are talking about a static hedging program and we are asking the question about the decision problem relating to the position size. So if you go back to your balance sheet, if you go to the balance sheet, right? So let's say we are looking at hedging the oil position. So we have 25 contracts. Our underlying position is long 25 contracts essentially 25,000 barrels so it's automatic in the sense that uh, you don't have free reign on it okay but at the same time there is some element of I'll write the explanation later but first understand what the situation is right so remember that your total position what is the golden rule of hedging you remember the golden rule of hedging that is the definition of a hedger the definition of the head of a hedger you are giving the definition of a hedger not net PNL net position net position not realization they give her the mic if we can total position yes okay but what is the golden rule of hedging again you're using net PNL again you're using PNL you know the difference between PNL and position so between you and uh, Pulkit I think you have figured out the uh, your, the answer is there between you and Pulkit but what is the right way to say it uh, These are very uh, simple concepts. Huh? The sum of underlying position and hedging position should be between mm -hmm. 0 to 1. 1? 1 no, 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 no. Now you have memorized it. No, no, you have memorized it. You know, it should be clear as a concept in your head what has to be done. Now you again memorize. So obviously, I will confuse you, you know, to just to see uh, how good your understanding is. So you have to, uh, instead of reading from your note or memorizing, uh, you should understand the concept in your head and then explain it you know what has to be done that in the because the idea behind because the definition it also connected it's also connected to the definition of a hedger the definition of a hedger is one whose 
first transaction must increase must decrease the total risk now you understand when we did this definition we had not come to this discussion on the case and hedging theory etc but now you understand why in the definition i wrote total risk i did not write risk alone i wrote total risk and total risk is meant to indicate risk on the underlying position plus risk on the hedge position all the hedge positions put together hedge portfolio right are you following what i'm saying yes. total risk is uh, indicate total risk the term total is used to indicate that it is the sum of underlying positions plus hedge positions right so the total risk has to be reduced okay because of the first transaction right on uh, uh, after the first transaction so the reason that's uh, that is basically again consistent with the philosophy behind hedging that the idea in hedging is to reduce risk and bring certainty to cash flows it is not to make a profit right so you'll see in your textbook there are some discussions about how hedging can sometimes be bad for you because it can reduce your profit that's actually a the wrong kind of orientation because that's not the orientation of hedging the objective of hedging is always to bring uh, if you have increased the certainty of your cash flows if you have or your returns okay and if you uh, you know basically uh, so that is the idea behind hedging to reduce risk and to bring certainty to cash flows then the hedging is so giving up profits having an opportunity loss that's not to be considered as a negative thing in a hedging context are you getting the idea you're getting the philosophy of hedging so, yeah so can we say that uh, when we look at the underlying position we drop money on then hedging so this can be called the golden rule no that's not the golden rule that is also the philosophy i mean that is one of the uh, the that is the idea that drives be your um, the idea that because the golden rule relates to position size it does not relate to risk it does not relate directly to pnl that's why when i was when she was saying pnl i was objecting the golden rule relates to the position size not to the pnl there's a difference between the two you understand that right there's a difference in pnl and position size so the golden rule relates to position size but you're right in the sense that uh, that is the thinking that drives your decisions to hedge like why do you hedge here for instance i gave you this example that if a hedging team is looking at this oil price chart and looking at previous patterns and they see that when the saudi oil facility was struck by the iranians the price shot up and then it started declining the initial reaction was sharp it was shot up then it declined to even lower levels than where it was okay so you could actually take a similar view and say that similar pattern is going to evolve now you have this shock okay and it seems quite likely i think most people will understand if you see the iranians made a statement the other day uh, that they had been speaking to a us reporter and they said that we are going to strike some us oil us army facilities military facilities not civilians but in return we ask that you do not retaliate which means they have already gone i mean after this hit that that's a sign of a guy who is basically now scared okay why are you saying that if we ask that you i'm not going to hit you i'm going to hit you but please don't hit me back okay so that means they are now scared okay and they will be obviously if you see how this guy was taken out with such a precision drone strike okay uh, and uh, so obviously they will be scared so so now you know so if you look at it from that point of view and if you take that kind of uh, approach to analyzing the market you are likely to feel that there's not going to be any escalation now although everybody is saying oh my god war is going to break out i personally think that my view is that the iranians will now back off because if they act funny the ayatollah might be next okay so <laughs> they have already taken out the number 2 and then trump trump is not somebody you fool around with that you can see i think quite clearly so th therefore you could take this view that uh, the price is now actually going to decline so coming back to what shreya is saying as a hedging team uh, member what is your thinking because you know your underlying position is long as long as the price is going up you are doing fine you don't have to worry so but when you feel that now there's a risk of a big drop in the price all the way down to 56 now you're worried because your underlying position will start to lose money if you if it falls here so to now stop the bleeding on your to, uh, total pnl you will now hedge let's say to take it uh, make us uh, create a simple scenario you will hedge 100% so you will sell 25 contracts here so that when it comes down here the underlying position would have lost value from 63 because remember your balance sheet is being marked to market continuously as a hedging team member you have to visualize that your balance sheet is being continuously updated prices are being continuously updated and you're being uh, all the assets and liabilities are being continuously revalued 
so the latest valuation of your inventory of 25,000 barrels is at 63 now if the price drops to 56 then the the inventory will suffer a loss from 63 to 56 so you if you have hedged here with 25 contracts the loss will still happen on the underlying position that you can't stop okay as long as you have the underlying position so the underlying position will lose value for 60 from 50 63 to 56 but there will be a corresponding gain on the hedge positions because you have sold 25 contracts so you will lose 25 on the underlying you will lose from here to here on the underlying position but you will have an offsetting gain on the hedge position so you have basically capped that's why i kept saying that when you hedge at a particular price if you hedge 100 percent okay then you are essentially locking in the realization for that in uh, asset or liability at that hedging price because your net result is still that you are long at uh, your inventory is valued at 63 your total valuation essentially is at 63 because you lose money on the underlying position but the hedge position uh, makes money because you went short 25 contracts and then it drops this is clear so your position your logic is correct it's just that that's not what we defined as the golden rule of hedging the golden rule of hedging is meant to keep you is an indirect control on risk it's meant to keep you within bounds so that your position because your initial underlying position here and remember again initial underlying position is always updated with new sales figures new position new production figures okay so the initial underlying position will always be updated but with that so the rule is essentially that your total position hedge plus underlying total position cannot go outside zero and the initial underlying position so once you understand the concept don't try to memorize it try to understand the concept understand once you understand you'll understand you'll get the idea okay if you if you play with it for a while you'll understand get the idea the idea is to make sure that your position size does not increase too much okay beyond these limits because then what you're doing is you are in you are increasing your risk if you go beyond zero if you go below zero then you are increasing your risk if you go above 25,000 net position you are increasing your risk and that is contradictory to the philosophy that contradicts the philosophy of hedging that is to reduce risk is this clear okay so why did I ask you about the golden rule of hedging what was the, um, I think somehow the question came up but anyway so what was I saying what was I discussing actually okay the position size we were discussing position size right we were discussing the position size decision problem so if you want to keep it simple the reason I said auto is here this auto answer is only correct now let now let me write this auto is make sure you understand what I'm writing okay auto is only correct if 100% hedging is done whenever the hedging team I'm re referring to as HT decides to hedge decides to hedge means uh, this price this entry price they they take a decision on the entry price okay that this is the time to enter just like here you analyze this market and you feel okay now is the time to enter because the market price is likely to fall so this answer of auto as far as this particular decision problem is concerned this answer is only correct if 100% hedging is done whenever the hedging team decides to hedge because you have your underlying position if you have a rule that you are going to hedge 100% to you know create a simple scenario that whenever you hedge you will hedge 100% so in that case it is automatic because that position size is 100% of the underlying position and the underlying position is not decided by the hedging team it is something that it's a pre-existing it's like an exogenous variable is given from outside okay so therefore that's why I'm saying auto are you able to follow that okay if um, if partial partial hedging means that I don't hedge 100% of the position okay are you following that if partial hedging is done then the um, DP DP is decision problem is being actively solved okay So 
have to understand this decision problem of number of units of position size because whenever you transact that is one of the decisions you have to take how many units do I sell or buy right so that's a decision so if you have so I've written it as auto with this uh, qualification here it's auto is only correct if 100% hedging is done whenever you hedge in that case it's automatic because you're 100% of the underlying position which is predetermined so there is no room for you to decide anything okay you can have this again can come out of your risk management policy the risk management policy document will specify all these things whether the hedging team has discretion to do partial hedging or not because company if it's very conservative it might say that if once you decide to hedge you hedge hundred percent and it's a static hedging program and then you just forget about it the advantage of that kind of approach is that it saves you a lot of time you don't really spend too much time following the market and all that right you just finish your hedging in one shot and that's it you're done so in that case it's auto but if your policy allows you to do partial hedging in that case here what i might do is instead of selling uh, 25 contracts i may sell 10 contracts okay because i'm not very sure that it'll actually go down that much so i'll sell only 10 contracts and then i'll wait and see in this case this decision to choose 10 out of 25 I could have chosen 12 I could have chosen 9 I could have chosen 6 I could have chosen 17 so there's a lot of choices available so here we have to say that the decision regarding the the solution to the number of units decision problem uh, number of units uh, position size decision problem in this case we have to say it's active because here the hedging team is using its discretion are you following because if you have a system where you are allowed to do partial hedging then partial is what partial i mean 10 percent 15 percent 25 percent 35 percent that is all to the up to the discretion of the hedging team and so therefore we must say it is being actively solved because they are actively choosing to decide some percentage 10 percent 35 percent 85 percent could be all kinds of choices are you clear is this clear why i'm saying this so it is auto but it could also be active depending on whether or not the policy uh, er, er, talks about 100% hedging or not. If the policy allows you to do partial hedging, then uh, the answer is active. So I'm just going to highlight this so that everyone's clear about this. Have you followed what I'm doing here? Okay. Why I've listened, uh, why I've written this in this manner. Okay. All right. So that finishes our decision problems and we are not going to deal with these initial and pyramiding this plot is uh, the question of pyramiding will not even arise in the case of uh, uh, in the case of uh, in the case of uh, passive risk books and running a hedge portfolio because pyramiding means again you risk going outside your golden rule if you start pyramiding means you're adding to your positions then you'll go outside your golden rule you're, you'll be going outside the limits of zero and the initial underlying position so pyramiding is not even applicable i've written na like this actually na should be without the full stops without the dots here na stands for not applicable okay all right okay an initial position basically here that we have already discussed this is what we have discussed when we talk about these uh, solution methods automatic or active we are referring to the initial decision okay so uh, that that's basically already covered as above right okay so that finishes our discussion of the um, of question number three in the case right question number three is the decision problems and a discussion of the decision problems uh, to get an understanding of how so if you do this exercise it will give you a good idea about how uh, hedging differ, differs from running a spec book which is what you have done in your first two projects where you have run a spec book which is a speculative book okay an investment fund where you could see that decision problems will be solved in a slightly different way and once you go through this detailed exercise and go through step by step to understand how it is solved it will also give you a very good understanding of how the hedging how classical hedging should be done and surprisingly many companies even listed companies don't follow this kind of a rigorous process they are just kind of doing seat of the pants you know like sometimes they may like i told you about the jp morgan london whale disaster so essentially what they did in the london whale disaster is that they violated the amount other things they violated the golden rule of hedging so they went on the other side and basically went it's the equivalent of going below zero 
Okay, so that's why they ended up losing, uh, and it was an illiquid market. So they ended up losing more than six six point three billion dollars or so. So that is because so you can see even a big massive bank like J P Morgan, probably one of the biggest banks in the world, uh, made a mistake like that in out of its London investment office. So this is why these principles are important to understand. Okay, so now we'll go on to the last um, two questions. Uh, yeah, four point one, four point two, and then five. So these three questions essentially relate to what we call swaps. Okay, so if you remember, we have discussed uh, all kinds of stuff. We have discussed. So we have covered let's see what kind of instruments we have covered we have we you have exposure to spot instruments because you have traded in spot equities on the nse okay you have exposure to options because you have traded us equity options you have exposure to futures because we have discussed futures and you're trading futures in this project okay the the one product that we are not going to have time to cover properly is forwards Okay, we are not going to have time to cover forwards. Forwards are fairly similar economically to futures, but there are some differences. There are differences in terms of the timing of the cash flows. The essential difference, if you understand between forwards and futures, if you once once you understand that forwards are an OTC product and futures are an exchange traded product, so then immediately all the differences that you have seen between OTC and exchange traded come into play. They all apply to forwards versus futures. Okay, so essentially forwards what you are not going to have in forwards is this daily settlement when you have a forward contract okay so if city bank enters into a forward contract with ICI PLC let's say it's a five-year forward contract to sell sterling against the US dollar in that case the cash flow the only cash flows that are going to happen are after five years because transaction date is today the settlement date is five years later so in the case of a forward contract the only cash flows that are going to happen is at the end uh, are going to at, at the end of five years when the settlement happens when the exchange of assets has to take place remember settlement date is a date on which the exchange of assets takes place and a transaction in a financial market is a contract to exchange assets why because you see how everything is connected because the financial market is a venue for exchanging assets one asset against the other so a contract are you following people are looking a little bit blank you remember all this stuff you did in IPM yes, that's why everything is connected okay all the concepts are connected that's why I don't really teach them as three separate courses although officially it's three separate courses actually the material is all connected okay so a market is a venue for exchanging assets one again asset against other, another a contract in a financial market a financial market transaction is a contract to exchange assets you've done contract law and lab when you enter into a contract there are mutual obligations yes. and when you fulfill those obligations you are discharging the obligations yes, right so uh, you have to discharge in this case your contract is to exchange assets so you discharge those obligations on the settlement date when you deliver the asset that you sold and you receive the asset that you bought and the other party fulfills its obligation to deliver that asset to you yes so you have a contract to exchange assets on the settlement date you must discharge the obligations under that contract so you have to connect everything to law as well whenever possible you have to connect everything to all other disciplines you have to see it from a multi multidisciplinary perspective because in real life that's how it works so uh, so in the case of a forward contract all that's going to happen is your the only cash flows that are going to happen is on the settlement date five years later the uh, ex assets will be exchanged so ICI PLC will be selling sterling and they will be receiving dollars so Citibank will send them the dollars and ICI will send them the sterling is this clear so five year forward contract to sell sterling against dollars so in between there are no cash flows that's the difference in a forward contract but if you do a futures contract which you want to keep on rolling over for five years remember a futures contract is exchange traded right so if it is exchange traded then what happens if you remember your own uh, your exchange traded contracts you have an exchange clearing house this guy wants to collect money every day when you lose money and pay you money every day when you make money so therefore on a, on a futures contract if you did the same thing with the sterling futures contract right you can go to your um, 
you can go here you can set up um, I think we'll see what the ticker is maybe GBP itself if we they give yeah so if you have British pound futures right we let's say we look at March futures now okay let's look at March futures so you have GBP March futures these are expiring on March 16th 2020 now if you enter into a transaction of course I couldn't take a five-year futures contract because they don't take trade that far out but if you enter into a transaction here in in this futures contract this is going to expire although this contract actually the final settlement for this contract is 16th March okay but there are going to be cash flows in this contract every day from now to 15th March because every day if I if I says if I sell sterling now here and then depending on what happens to sterling, if I sell sterling today and then tomorrow's price is say 135 that means I've made money or lost money One. If I sell now and the next day's price is 135, I lost money. So I have to pay this difference about 300 points, right? So I have to pay whatever number of contracts I've sold. This one I think is uh, 125,000. You have to look up the contract size. I think the contract size is 125,000 pounds. Okay, because remember it's a futures contract, exchange traded, therefore standardized contract terms. Okay, so there's a standard size. So you just sell one contract and whatever the size that is. So that into that 300 points difference, I have I have that big a loss. So next immediate next day, I have to pay that loss to the exchange clearing house. This guy is going to collect. This guy is going to collect from me, from me here through my clearing member goes to the exchange clearing house. He passes on the loss. My loss is the other guy's profit. He passes. He takes this profit, my loss and he passes it through the other clearing member into it uh, on to the other guy right remember okay so this is what what this means essentially is that in a futures contract you're going to have cash flows every day because of the fact that a futures contract is exchange traded so there's daily settlement of profits and losses all right the, there is the essential difference between futures and forwards otherwise economically they are the same essentially economically they're the same but obviously the cash flow timing differences make a do have an impact okay so you have because you have to fund those losses in forward we set a particular price for the next five years and if the like, could be any maturity could be any, any maturity, maturity yeah and if the price at the majority is above that price then we have profit and if the price is less than that then we have to yeah if you have bought and the price is higher than that then you have a profit and then if you have sold uh, if you have bought and the price is lower then you have a loss in futures we don't uh, set a particular price for the uh, that underlying asset so then why no 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 that statement is not correct the statement you made last is not correct both are let's take a simpler example let's let's take a futures versus forwards here okay in the case of for, uh, let's take instead of taking a five-year forward transaction let's take a forward con uh, contract that matures on 16th march let's take a forward contract that matures on 16th march so the only difference let's say by 16th march the ultimate price is 145 okay and you sell at 131.95 so you're going to suffer a big loss the only difference between the futures and the forwards is in the case of the forwards you are in the case of the forward contract you will realize that loss in one shot at the end because in between there are no cash flows because it's an otc contract forward contract okay right so you sell at 131.95 the final price is 145 the march 16th price of uh, cable okay is is uh, 145 so you're going to suffer a loss in the case of the forward you're going to suffer that loss in one short lump sum at the end at the maturity of the contract because in a forward contract there are no intervening cash flows yes clear otc contract that's why there is risk right but in the case of a futures contract as you know there is a daily settlement of profits and losses so when this thing goes let's say if we draw up a chart from this for this you can't see much okay anyway doesn't matter uh, so here what is happening if i sell here now it goes now as it goes to 145 let's assume for the sake of simplicity that this thing goes in from now to 16th march it goes steadily up all the way to 145 okay in this case what's happening is uh, in the case of the futures contract i'm not realizing the loss in one shot at lump sum at the end 
I am realizing the loss in small bits and pieces every day because today it goes from 131.96 to 133. So I have to pay the difference between 133 and 131.96. But now I'm short at 133. So if the next day it goes from 33 to 34, I'm paying only one one dollar, one cent actually, one US cent. Okay, are you following what I'm saying? So in the case of you, and that's and so on and so forth, all the way it goes to 145. The total loss, if you include, in, if you ignore the interest cost of it, if you ignore the time value of money, if you ignore the time value of money, then the total loss is the same. The difference in the case of the futures is you're realizing it in uh, bit by bit, day by day, in small chunks, all the way to 145. Are you following the realization of the loss? In the case of the forwards, you're realizing the whole loss in one shot at the end of the contract. Yes, clear? So this loss is uh, in the forward, it is dependent on the R, uh, on fixed price. And if no, no, in both it, cases, a fixed price. In both cases, you're going short. Let's see, let's assume that they, they don't have to be exactly equal. But let's assume that the futures and forwards, are, they will be more or less close to each other. So if you look at a forward price for, because if you look at now, let's look at GBP USD spot. Okay. Now you see the differences in, um, yeah. Is there a difference between the spot and the March 16th futures price? Market is the same. When we are comparing this with this, the market is the same. The market is still cable. Yes? Market is defined by the two unique assets. If I am pricing gold and US dollar terms, like here, gold and US dollar terms, that's a particular market. Okay? But if I start pricing gold and yen terms, now the terms asset has changed. Now from no from US dollar it's gone to yen. Now that's a different market. Anytime you change one of the asset, it becomes a different market. But here the asset is the same. I mean, the, the market is the same. Between this and this, the market is the same. Because both are GBP USD. Okay. So this sterling futures, this is against the US dollar. Okay. So, so I'm telling you that. Okay. Uh, and this obviously you can see is GBP USD cable, spot cable. Both cases, the market is the same. Yes. But the instruments are different. That's why you have a framework like this, which talks about markets and instruments. So here under currencies, under spot in this box, you have to imagine all the possible currency pairs in the world. Turkish Lira against Japanese Yen, everything you can think of, NC2, using the permutation combination philosophy. In this box, you have to imagine that there are so many markets, which is equal to NC2 with n equal to maybe 169 or whatever number of currencies in the world yes you remember all that yes not getting a clean answer that is how you're supposed to use this framework i can't draw all this here all this here because i can't magnify so much but you have to remember that in this box there are nc2 markets where let's say n is equal to 169 number of currencies that many markets okay nigerian naira against uh, south korean won every possible combination you can think of is located in this box you have to imagine that yes yes power what is your question maybe you can use the mic yeah are you following so far yes sir okay what happened to aurora is knocked out can't handle it didn't sleep enough yes yeah. Uh, in this GBP, the other one, second last, sir, the transition is not end when we are solely assets. Like, why we are comparing it to the uh, next day uh, price? Because it's a futures contract. It's a futures contract. So, what is the futures contract? Is exchange traded? The moment you see futures contract, immediately a bell should go off in your head saying it's exchange traded. So, if we are sold, and if I go up, it is a loss. And if it Next goes day, down, then, we have, it is then you have a profit. But if you, we don't have so, uh, sold any uh, position, and we have like uh, we are on one point three one five, the uh, the situation is reversed. Like if they goes up, then we have profit. And no, if you have not done any transaction, then how can you have a profit? You just said that if we have not sold, now, hmm? we can sell it to a higher price. Yeah. 
if you have not sold now if it goes to 135 then you can sell it at 145 yeah that's correct that's fine but we are considering the example that i was talking about to show you the difference between a forward contract and a futures contract that's what i was trying to illustrate right so i was saying that since this, this particular futures contract matures on 16th march so let's take an example of a 16th march forward contract in comparison okay so the difference that will happen is and let's assume that the price of the futures and the forwards is the same it will be more or less very close to each other so if i sell forward at 131.95 then and the final price on 16th march is 145 then this loss between 31 uh, 32 let's say 32 and 145 uh, uh, 32 and 45 the different that loss in the case of the forward contract i will re realize that loss in one shot lump sum at the end on 16th march yes because there are no intervening cash flows in an otc contract in general okay but uh, in the case of the futures contract if i sell this now at 131.95 if tomorrow's price is 133 i'll have to immediately pay the difference between 131.95 and 133 and then the next day's price is 134 then i have to pay the difference between 133 and 134 so the difference is eventually the total loss if you ignore the time value of money the reason i'm saying ignore the time value of money is that moment on first on the first day you have to pay say 132 to 133 that loss has to be funded so you have to take the interest cost of that funding you have to pay that amount right where's the where's the money going to come from you have to borrow that money and pay it so you have to pay the you have to consider the interest cost on that borrowing that's why i'm saying to keep it simple let's forget about the time value of money but if you forget about the time value of money your total loss in the case of the forward or the future is the same from 131.95 to 145 in both cases the difference is in the forward case you are realizing that loss in one shot lump sum at the end but in the case of the futures you are realizing that loss bit by bit little bit every day so that eventually it on the first day it goes to on the first day it goes to where is this yeah on the first day it goes to 33 so you realize this much loss next day it goes to 34 you realize extra loss of one one cent then it goes to 36 then you realize a loss of two cents day to day you realize small chunks of the loss the total loss comes to be the same ignoring the time value of money is this clear this is the difference between hmm? till the maturity yeah maturity is 16th march right so that's the only difference so you understand now the difference between forwards and futures economically they are the same if you ignore the time value, but you can't of course in real life ignore the time value of money because that matters so therefore there is a problem in equating that's why you can't always say that futures and forwards will always have the same price okay uh, theoretically they should be very close but there is not it's really strictly speaking not possible to arbitrage the difference if there's any difference because you don't know how the loss pattern is going to evolve in the futures that maybe you have to pay a certain big amount and maybe that day the overnight interest rate is very high because every day you're borrowing overnight right to fund the loss that day if the interest rate is overnight is too high okay then you have to pay a huge cost so basically you can't predict in advance you can't do classical riskless arbitrage here because you can't predict in advance all the cost some of the cost is unknown because you don't know how the interest rate will evolve but this is the essential difference you don't need to get into all those complications the main difference you have to understand is uh, we are coming well i'll come to the questions the main difference you have to understand is that in the case of the forwards remember this example right you did the same transaction you have the same total loss ignoring the time value of money in the case of the forwards with odc instrument you realize the loss lump sum at the end in the case of the forwards you realize the same amount of loss but bit by bit small amounts every day this is the difference daily settlement of profits and losses because futures exchange traded yeah oh sorry sorry i'm yeah in the, i'm saying it so many times i'm getting confused yeah so essentially futures exchange just remember futures exchange traded daily settlement of profits and losses forwards otc one shot settlement at maturity date okay that's the difference sorry i might i wasn't even aware now i tell you guys to be aware of what you're saying but i'm saying it so many times that i'm forgetting yes Saloni, what is your question we'll come to mehak after this yeah yeah at the maturity
authority right that's it basically sorry come again the interest for which the person has to pay that's only forward or in future also? No, interest cost, you see, even in the in the case of the forwards, you have to pay the interest cost. But in the case of the futures, what's happening is, but you pay that at the end. You have to pay that at the end if you fund that loss, right? When you fund that loss. That would be net interest uh, What do you mean by net? Profit on my forward uh, for my. Hmm. So now the, the other company has to pay me that money. Yeah. The firm is taking no, the other company will not pay you. What the other company will do, let's say, let's, let's look at this forward contract. If you have sold cable at 131.96 for 16th March settlement, and then on 16th March the price of cable is 123. Let's say the price of cable is 123 here. On 16th March the price drops here. Since you have sold here and the market price on the settlement date is this much, you make money because under the contract you can sell cable at 131 at 132 and you get a much larger number of dollars you get 132 dollars for each pound let's assume the tra transaction is for one pound for simplicity so he sold one pound at 132 for 16th march <coughs> and on 16th march the actual market price is 130 123 okay so what happens you sold pounds and you bought dollars right and on this day it is one third under the contract you are selling pounds at this rate and you are buying dollars so here what is happening is at 123 when the market price is 123 you can buy essentially with you with uh, with the 132 dollars that you're going to get okay you you need to spend only 132 so just try to understand the how the profit cash flows work right because you are going to get 132 dollars under the under the uh, under the uh, contract but and you will sell minus one sterling but plus 132 dollars on the corresponding side and the market side you take that you, where do you get that sterling from you buy it in the market you buy it in the market it costs you only 123 dollars okay so you have the difference between 32 cents and 23 cents that will remain in your dollar balance because the sterling side will cancel out you will buy one sterling in the market spending 1.23 dollars are you following yes, you'll buy one sterling in the market and use that sterling to deliver against your short position in the contract under sterling you have to deliver one sterling you will deliver that one sterling buy it in the market at 123 but when you deliver that one sterling under the contract you are given 132 so 32 cents minus 23 cents is the difference that difference will remain as a plus as a credit in your dollar account yes are you following so you made a profit so this is how the profit works okay because you get delivery at the contract and then uh, and the flip side you have the same problem on the loss side okay this is how it works okay so don't worry so much about the interest flow at this point it might confuse you uh, just focus on the um, if I take it here does it still it's going out a little bit okay so um, anyway just focus on the fact that the loss realization is in bits and pieces in the case of the futures contract and it is uh, it's in bits and pieces in the case of the futures contract and it is um, yeah it is lump sum in the case of the forward okay so since we had it's important to have the discussion because we are not going to have time to cover forward contracts the only two sessions left so these are the instruments that you have covered but understand this once again visualization how to use this framework inside this box there are nc2 markets okay all kinds of currency combinations you can think of okay south african rand against canadian dollars everything you can think of nc2 same thing here if the contracts exist somebody has to put it on as in the exchange some exchange has to put it on as a contract but theoretically it's possible okay same combination nc2 theoretically it's possible to have futures contracts the difference you can see is prices are not the same market is the same cable gbp usd is the market market is the same but this is spot and this is futures are you following the scheme and therefore you see that although the market is the same because the instruments are different then therefore the prices are also different is this clear are you follow are you can you see that these prices are different okay if you want to see another thing if you see 
let's see how far forward they have the futures I'll give you um, yeah they're not listing beyond March because it doesn't really trade that much far out uh, in the in the futures contract okay so anyway uh, but technically you can theoretically you can go further out okay and you'll see further differences in the price because here the settlement date is different and this is again reflecting the time value of money can you see that because this spot settlement this will have to be settled after two days okay this will have to be settled after two days this is settling on 16th March okay so the settlement date is different ordinarily you would expect the price of the instrument to be different okay the market price and you can as I said every time you see a market price it's a price of some instrument or the other this is the spot instrument price this is the futures instrument price okay clear now we are going on to swaps yeah no we would not treat them as two different market the order of the currencies is not different we would treat them as the same market but the convention is to have GBP as the this is just a convention the G convention is to have GBP as a base asset so you would only call it a different market if you change one of the base one of the assets in this case the market is the same huh? no but you have not changed any of the assets you have flipped around the order of the assets which is which is being shown first in this case you write it as but nobody trades USD against G, nobody trades the market convention because we have to also be anchored in the markets so the way we define a market is the two assets have to remain the same because very often what happens is even in this spot GBP market okay in the sense the convention is to trade in terms of the base your base currency so in the foreign exchange markets if you're asking for a price between dealers in the OTC markets the convention is the, your round amounts of 1 million base your 1 million units of base currency so if you're trading cable normally you should be asking for a price in 1 million sterling 2 million 3 million 10 million sterling etc so in that case you would just write it as GBP 10 if you're asking for a price in 10 million sterling you would just write it as GBP 10 because everybody understands that it is 10 million okay million units of base currency that is the convention so now nobody trades but in that market also the reason it's the same market is that in that market also sometimes if a corporate has a requirement to trade in US dollar amounts so they can say uh, GBP USD they can call for a price and say GBP USD in 10 million USD so in that case because they are departing from the convention so they have to specify the amount that clearly they have to say GBP USD in 10 million USD otherwise if you are just going by the convention which is to quote the uh, to trade in terms of million units of base currency in that case you just ask for a if you want to trade in sterling 10 million you just say GBP USD for 10 that is understood as base base currency units million units of base currency but if you want to trade you can do that also you can call a bank and say I want a price in GBP USD you would say cable actually you say I want a cable price for 10 million USD now you have to mention it because you want to trade in terms currency amount that is not the convention right so if you like it's in, the, in the, here we buy bananas by the dozen if you want to buy bananas by weight you will have to tell him you have to specify that you know I want to buy it by weight so whenever you're departing from the convention you have to make it clearer with with additional language but the market remains the same the market only changes when you change one of the assets is it clear okay all right okay so let's go on now what we are going to do is we are going to go on to so what you have covered is you've covered spot okay you've covered futures we have some idea about forwards versus futures now you've also covered options now what we are going to do is we're trying to cover swaps okay so let's first get into a taxonomy of swaps so we have a note which I think should be in your um, in your folder uh, maybe it's in the if it's not I'll put it in there at the end of this class yes it's there you have a technical note on swaps in your case because some of the questions in the case relate to swaps these last three questions in the case relate to swaps 4.1 4.2 and 5 all right so now we're going to cover swaps so let's look at the uh, technical note on swaps 
this. This is okay because we made this now, we'll just make it bigger. This is a problem with Chrome actually, they should fix it. If I increase the zoom for one tab, it just changes for all the tabs. And in Firefox, it's not like that. In Firefox, you can change the zoom for one tab and it doesn't change the zoom for the other tabs. But in Chrome, it seems to be like this, that everything changes uh, in one uh, go. Okay, where is this futures? Is this, uh, I think this is the one for swaps. Yeah, okay. So let's go to swaps, okay? So let's first be a, a clear about the, um, what is the zoom here? Yeah, okay, finally we have 100%. I'm gonna make this. So for swaps, the two references that you're going to use, I'll give you some references. Here you can see chapter 7 on Hal Basu. It says 9th edition here, but it's 10th. Uh, you guys have 10th. The edition, the ch it doesn't change actually. If I go here, I can see that chapter 7 is swaps. Okay. Maybe it's not. read the introduction of the swaps thing but let me first give you a proper taxonomy of swaps that's very important you understand taxonomy the science of classification and is also used to refer to a particular classification okay so if I ref if I classify the students on this campus into uh, law students MCA students BCA students some people are PGDM students some are um, English students okay so that's a classification that we would call a taxonomy of BIP students okay we have taken all the students and we have put them into certain classes in categories yeah okay so that taxonomy is very important because otherwise you don't get the right perspective on a field and uh, you also have to use the right terminology that is uh, very important because your it affects your understanding of the material okay so now the problem that we have is we are basically looking at two types of swaps okay we're looking at what we would call capital market swaps where have I written this okay let's refer to your uh, also refer to your have I referred you to to let's refer to your working note this is also important okay here in your your calc file yeah so what we actually want to do is we want to classify This is the high level classification, okay? We want actually this should be um, X box, we call it. This classification should be in this note. Okay, so let's call them FX. We can call them FX swaps, so we can also more correctly call them. Uh, this is the FX swap structure, but let's call it. There's a better way to define it. Okay, because we will. There's a better name for it actually. We'll put this at the end. FX swaps, all right. So now, first understand how the market um, how the market uh, refers to these products. Okay, so we are going to basically this is going to be our high level uh, taxonomy. Okay, we'll call them uh, capital market swaps. Okay, and we're going to call them this is going to be a high level taxonomy. So all swaps are divided into capital market swaps and position maturity altering swaps. Okay, so for swaps, you can also refer to this book. Uh, there's a very long discussion on swaps and uh, and uh, and uh, swap options and all that. You can refer to here under interest rate risk management. You can look at all kinds of interest rate and currency swaps. Okay, you will the, your syllabus is whatever I actually cover in the class. But if you want to read up on uh, on the material, okay, you can. Read 
read up if you want to read up on all kinds of exotic swap structures uh, you can uh, read up from here swap and option structures covering interest rate risk management and swap uh, and currency risk management and don't worry about the fact this book was written in 1993 but everything is still 100% relevant because the products have not changed so the book deals with the product features the product features and the product application so this is still 100% relevant because if you if you remember actually when we teach you contract law when do you think that law was written that law was actually codified in from like the 1200 or 1250 1200 1300s in the in the uk eventually it was written and codified in india in 1872 as the indian contract act and we haven't really changed it much so we are actually still working with the law of contract which evolved even earlier than 1822 and was codified in india in 1872 so the fundamental principles don't change you know so when you see some of your conclaves people come and say whatever you learned today it becomes irrelevant tomorrow those are kind of superficial statements because the fundamental principles don't change okay you can see this everything i checked it once because i wrote this in 1993 now everything is 100 percent relevant because none of the products have changed okay one or two new products have come but all the products are covered here um, i mean at whatever was available at that time and nothing has changed product features so it's still 100 percent relevant so you can use this for further reading and it will also be useful because lots of graphs are provided here in this book and you can also use the chapter 7 for swaps okay and then i'll give you this but what you will not find uh, if, uh, in any of the books is this kind of a taxonomy which i think is very important which is to understand that this is the let's see what the color is here so under this orange the third one okay all right so this is your uh, basically these are the two types of swaps so is this clear it will become clear later on in terms of what they actually are but first understand the taxonomy this is the right way to classify it okay because uh, this capital market swaps which uh, and give this a little bit of we're losing the connection are you following what we are doing here this is referred to so i'm going to use two what we are doing here is the terminology used in the market is not accurate in the sense it's not a good terminology so i'm giving you a taxonomy which is the right way to classify it which gives you the the proper distinction between the two products so what we are doing is the two types of uh, swap contracts that the market refers to are these um, right so the market uses uh, are you following me here okay so let me just tell you to, so you need to be familiar so you have to study at two levels okay just like when i taught you arbitrage i taught you what is classical riskless arbitrage and i taught you all the other various uses like uh, uncovered interest arbitrage risk arbitrage statistical arbitrage all are terms used by the market so if you see these terms you will not understand that they are actually not arbitrage so you have to be familiar with the market's terms and you have to use you have to talk in the lingo of the market so when you're talking about statistics, you'll have to use the word statab okay but you should know in your mind that this is not true cra because it is risky okay it contains i mean it, it retains market risk so similarly i'm going to teach you first the lingo of the market and then i'm going to show you why the lingo of the market is not correct and i'll show you what the correct taxonomy is so you will have to have knowledge at two levels understand and speak the lingo of the market but also theoretically be clear why that classification in the market the market taxonomy and the taxonomy implied by the market's language is not correct okay so first the market's language market talks about two types of swaps basically they say swaps when they say swaps they are referring to these kind of in, uh, transactions they are referring to these um, interest rate and currency swaps okay such as these kind of swaps basis swap these all these interest rate and currency swaps is what the market is referring to as uh, cap as uh, swaps when they use the term swaps the market is referring to all these kinds of interest rate and currency swaps which you can see discussed in chapter one over here okay this you will find in your finance reference folder uh, from your ipm uh, days okay now and the other term that the market uses is what we have called 
it's a long name but the, it's the correct name it tells you actually what is happening here so the other name that the market uses is fx swaps the other context in which the market uses is uh, the word swaps is fx swaps okay so this is the basic classification capital market swaps and fx swaps i uh, sorry markets classification is swaps which is referring to interest rate and currency swaps and fx swaps which is referring to these foreign exchange swaps okay but the true classification should be that one should be called capital market swaps one category should be called capital market swap that is these kind of instruments these should be called capital market swaps uh, we still have some time so don't get restless so these kind of instruments which are very commonly used interest rate swaps currency swaps which is what you will see discussed when you go to your hull chapter when you go to your hull chapter in swaps this guy is actually discussing these interest rate and currency swaps okay he's discussing these products interest rate and currency swaps which are again market terms that are used okay uh, so all this stuff that is he is talking about interest rate swaps he's talking about this stuff which the market calls swaps okay and then he does not really discuss fx swaps in this chapter okay so but what we are saying is that the, we will classify as two different class categories capital market swaps and position maturity altering swaps which we are not going to have time to discuss okay so we are going to just discuss one category uh, which is uh, also required for the answers to our questions so if you look at these questions in the case these three last three questions in the case these are uh, basically these relate to the type of products that are covered what i'm calling capital market swaps okay and which the market calls swaps which are normally referred to the types of instruments are interest rate and currency swaps you can read here chapter one it'll be good for you to read a simpler version maybe you can start with this book first and then go to hull because this is much simpler okay but although it covers no need to cover all these various uh, you know complicated versions but just the initial uh, interest rate and as far as currency swap structure so this is what we are going to cover okay cap so i'm not going to spend too much time on the taxonomy the reason i'm calling it capital market swaps is because they are normally they were usually issued and they're always connected to some kind of capital market transaction you understand capital markets raising money either through debt or equity in this case these are all connected to debt okay we don't connect it to equity issuance so they're all connected to some kind of debt issuance but we are just using the general word capital markets so that's why i'm calling it capital market swaps because they are more or they're always connected to some previous or current issuance of uh, capital market instrument okay okay so now uh, we have a little time we'll make a small start okay i want to cover because we are a little, little short on time we have to finish this one minute one minute one minute one minute we have don't i'm watching the time one minute guys so we forget about fx swaps for this part because we can't cover it let's try and understand we are only talking about what the market calls swaps and what we are deciding to call capital market swaps they are also referred to by the market as interest rate and currency swaps but what i'm going to say at all our interest rate swaps okay a swap is basically going to be like this okay basic structure of a swap please read properly okay read from this book see the 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 uh, pictures try to understand same pictures i've drawn here a swap is always like this abc is the company abc is the company and scb is say standard chartered bank there are going to be two counterparties there's a transaction market transaction there'll be two counterparties pretty obvious okay now there are going to be some flows okay there'll be a period of time that is fixed could be three years five years ten years twenty years whatever and there are going to be periodic exchanges of interest payments okay now in this particular example i have considered this example where um, you have abc is making a fixed interest rate payment and standard chartered bank is making a floating interest rate payment okay so we will discuss this for now the time is up so i won't hold you back but please go back and read because we need to cover swaps in the next class because these last three questions in the case relate to interest rate and currency swaps this is clear yes. we are going to cover please cover and read it read the chapter one i would say um, we have to really um,
so I'm actually going to do what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the video a little bit longer so that you have uh, an understanding of um, so yeah good question good question but remember what are futures futures are exchange traded instruments why do you choose exchange traded instruments as opposed to OTC what might be your motivation so that the clearing house is there in between so low what do we say in technical terms you are uh, yeah so what is the technical term that we want to use because you're not layman anymore you're finance students so the technical term that you should be so there is lack of chance of so money not being realized virtually non-existent credit risk the term that you should be using the word i was looking for is credit risk so credit risk because of the presence of the exchange clearing house credit risk is virtually non-existent non-existent that's one of the major motivations for using an exchange credit product even though you have the headache of daily settlement but that's what makes you choose if you're more worried about credit risk than about daily settlement and there are many other aspects also there's also liquidity for instance if you are trading let's say you want to make this some big news in the Middle East some uh, action by the US that's going to affect the crude oil price if you are a speculator you have, there's also the aspect of liquidity so in the case of crude oil it differs from market to market but in the case of crude oil the best market to hit the most liquid market is the futures market of all the instruments okay and rather than tying up a tanker the, if you have some special news on the market and you really want to act quickly what you would hit is the futures market you would hit the crude oil futures market fast first because this is trading all the time as you can see okay and uh, and it's very liquid so you would hit that first now that happens to be an exchange traded instrument so sometimes you it you may not be motivated only by credit risk you might be motivated by considerations of liquidity which mar it, it differs from uh, asset class to asset class market to market depending on how the market has evolved certain cases like in the case of spot in the case of the currency markets spot currencies are the most liquid so if you want to hit the currency market fast with big volume you would not use futures you would use the spot market so it differs from market to market asset class to asset class but liquidity is also another major consideration which uh, you know leads you to the choice of market it could also be things like customization of contracts which you would take you into OTC markets it could be considerations of fear of credit risk which would push you into credit uh, into exchange traded markets that's these are the kinds of considerations that drive your decision making clear yeah yeah so, you explain about net PNL that, uh, that's the sum of hedging and your position will be equal to zero so that is the explanation of holding. again you're using the word PNL because you use that no 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 I, and, and I, that's why I'm writing no 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 maybe everywhere. no no you don't have to write so much because uh, I'm giving you so many notes yeah but so I maybe you yeah notes. maybe you, you if you want to take notes you can take but the point is that I mean I may have said it like today I mixed up futures and forwards because I've been using these words so many times so so uh, but I would not have said no read no that's why one minute one minute that's why you should read the notes what does the notes say here if you look at the note right where the where i think we have discussed the golden rule of hedging in uh, your project uh, in the project brief right in the project brief which i have appended to the end of this yeah this is the golden rule of hedging so you should read it from here from my notes these notes are prepared with the, the very painstakingly prepared with a lot of care taken to the use of words so in a class when I'm using I was saying this same word so many times as I made a mistake I mixed up and I didn't even realize it that I mixed up forwards and futures but here when I'm writing it, this is clearly written so you should follow it from here not from your notes so it's not PNL it's position the golden rule of hedging applies to position size you're trying to contain the position size 
coincides to between zero and the initial underlying position. That's what. It's not PNL. Okay. Right. So we will write that sum of underlying position H position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we have to write this yeah. only if you yeah. give an exam. No, no. Okay. You don't have to write this in the sense like you know I'm not going to penalize you for grammatical mistakes or something. You should have the basic idea. Obviously, if you write PNL in place of position, now that's a totally different thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, if if you instead of profit and loss account, if you write profit and loss AC or something, that you can do short form and all that. As long as we understand what you're trying to say. But if you write PNL for profit uh, instead of position, if you write PNL, that's not correct. Yeah, so you don't have to write in the sense you don't have to memorize this. That's why I keep on telling you, don't memorize these things because I'm not penalizing you for. I'm not expecting you to write beautiful English sentences grammatically correct. I'm just looking for some keywords. What are the keywords here? Yeah, I've even highlighted the keywords. Net position. Keywords. Always look at the keywords. Net position. Zero and initial and the bounds. Net position and bounds. Okay. So net position has to stay within bounds. That's the idea. What are the bounds? Zero and initial initial underlying position. That's it. Now you can write it in any way you want okay so as long as this idea comes across so your grammar, grammar can be all over the place i don't penalize people for that as long as the concept is clear is this clear this concept was like with which you explained on the excel sheet on the on the excel sheet you explained this concept huh? yeah hedging because underlying position that was coming out to be zero so uh, that's why you might have used net pnl many times that's why i wrote every no no net pnl i would not have used in this Kind of, I don't think I'd make that kind of mistake so many times because video again no, no, no. you watch it and you find if you find something where I'm talking about PNL and talking about the golden rule of hedging uh, I doubt I would have done that because I don't think I'll make that kind of mistake so many times <laughs> only now uh, today I might have made that mistake once. Yeah, no, no, three, no, no, that's why you should refer to these notes are being given to you you should refer to the notes when you I have a confusion whatever you teach in uh, class yeah no, that's fine that's good at the end uh, of the that's that's good that you're learning from the class that's fine but uh, that's why I'm saying that you maybe you don't need to take so many notes because the notes are available to you most of the stuff that I'm writing you can take if you if you're taking it it's fine that's a good thing but uh, at the end of the day you must refer to the notes I've given you because there I, I won't have any mistakes I mean if I have I'll be able to correct it right yeah and then here make sure that you guys follow from here if you read interest rate and currency swaps from here this is what we're going to cover okay um, the various types of interest rate and currency swaps you can see the you can see the structures over here they're nice diagrams is very simply written so here from here you can understand okay so we're going to cover all this in the next class so we have very little time we must finish the discussion of the case we have only one class left so uh, yeah so um, right but at least you're able are you able to follow the discussion as relating to the case you're able to follow it okay it is easy to follow my case yeah because but from the case sometimes when we go into the discussion of decision problems we have to go into another page because uh, we are writing so many things right so we have to go into the other page uh, because we are writing so many things so we are going into decision problems so we have to go here and look at them but we always have the reference of the case you are able to follow the case so okay. you'll, uh, you'll give, uh, not this but like different case in exam also like we have to do like this prepare like this no case for math no, no. yeah it I mean might... you're talking about other subjects no for the subjects yeah. in the exam yeah. we'll give some case and we have to analyze yeah, 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 like yeah. this there will be a case and there'll be some other questions right but these concepts you have to internalize these concepts as we can see many people are still not clear about the golden rule of hedging itself which you are supposed to be aware of while doing your project so basic stuff you guys have to pick up make sure you have basic stuff properly covered yeah so on day one minute one minute so I'm closing